Thanks, everyone. Well, it's great to be back in Donegal. I think this is my fifth year now um, doing this, including three key years when I spent time trying to explain how we were coming out of the recovery, and we better be careful that we weren't going to be heading into some of the shortages that we're actually suffering. So I, when Joe chased me down, he didn't actually have to do as much sort of forcing as, as, as was said earlier, because I really was anxious to come here. Because I suppose if there's one regret I have, and I probably only have one regret for my time at the department, it was that as we reached the end of the bailout, we made a serious effort in the department to try and get the system and the politicians to come up with a medium-term economic strategy for leaving the bailout, for dealing with a lot of the issues that we're now struggling with. And I, and I don't think we managed to do it. That's one of the reasons why I've stayed as passionately involved in this debate since then, because a lot of the issues that have surfaced since then were frankly just non-present in the system, which is of, of, was of major concern looking, looking back. Um, I suppose it, has, it is true, though, I've spent a week pretty much on the road and a lot of travel between various cities that were mentioned here, like Copenhagen, Luxembourg, indeed others, Paris, Toulouse, and, and Dublin. And I've been reading a book by Helen Russell, which I recommend to a lot of people, which is A Year of Living Danishly. Um, which will give people a lot of, of thinking differently about what might be important in life. And in some ways I want to start there today with, with the sort of the main message of that book and, and indeed some of the messages coming across Europe, which is that it is that ever increasing individualism. And I suppose I should say one thing, which is that having been described at various stages as Mr. Austerity in the, in the, the, in the department days, when I give some of the speech um, things that I'm about to say here, I've been described as the Secretary General of the Department of Finance having turned into a socialist. Um, but I think there are some very important messages that I just don't think we're still listening to or thinking about as we go through the planning that we're talking about here. And one of the most important things is that this increasing individualism that's creeping into our society, in particular this sort of striving for increasing individual household wealth, is not going to be the answer to happiness. What we need to have for a national happiness is to continue to work with some of the things we've had long, many years ago, which is much greater trust between citizens of the nation and much greater trust between the citizens and the government, which is to deliver their country for them. And it's when we develop that trust, we actually get into feeling safer about our communities, and that's when we move towards national happiness. And I think we often strive and look at a lot of things in the, in the, with the wrong measures. When you look at what other European countries do, and I agree with a lot of what's been said about some of the urbanization trends that we're seeing, but you also see a much greater recognition of the role that well-designed public infrastructure and public services can play to generate that feeling of mutual trust among people to develop that community. And that's where the planning comes into it. That's where we have to do a much better job of actually how we plan for the future that we're trying to develop into our nation. And we can do so by letting markets actually run it for us. That's pretty much what we did leading up to the boom. We, we outsourced an awful lot of this to private developers. Or we can do so with a proper national level holistic plan which intervenes and which regulates as appropriate to make sure that the work worst excesses are taken out, and I probably disagree with Connor, which I do think that fairness is actually an important element in terms of deciding what is actually appropriate or not. That will not only guide private investment, but will actually also encourage it. Rome wasn't built in a day, but it is at least very helpful if you know how and where you're going to build Rome in order to actually encourage a hotelier or an apartment developer to actually want to develop there. And what has been missing in, in the way we've run Ireland up to now is we've just sort of left things just develop in this ra rather haphazard way without actually helping to explain where our destination is in terms of where we're going. But most importantly, what we have not done, it seems to me, in Ireland is we have not done a good enough job, and I'll get into this in more detail, about subordinating individual rights to the common good. Property owners, developers, car owners, I could go on, have been left to have their voices heard more than the common good. And by doing so, we've actually started to develop a country that has new inequalities in it, new divisions across our society, that when I make this audience to different audiences than this, you find it resonates quite a lot with what we're saying. And if you look across other countries, 
particularly Denmark where I've spent a lot of time in the last week, people don't object to paying higher taxes if they trust how the government will spend it and they believe that the government will do a good job in terms of how they actually um, do that. But in order to actually develop that trust, then it has not got to be the people who shout the loudest, who can open the doors the most easiest, who actually get their way. We were promised at the last election a new politics. We were promised a new world of better debate, a better decision making. And I think unfortunately we're looking at a rather unproductive parliament dealing with some of the most pressing challenges that we've had to face within the country, including Brexit, geopolitical issues, and frankly these major shortages again that are causing imme immeasurable suffering to thousands, um, if not hundreds of thousands on the island. And what's missing, it seems to me, and this is what some of the articles I wrote before Christmas is, is we have no sense of the destination. We have no sense of where we're going in 40 or 50 years, what Ireland will look like, even the general principles that Connor was mentioning earlier. Yesterday's climate action plan, which of course was a long document, so maybe not all of you had time to read it, but was another example of all that missing in terms of the decisions we're taking. There was actually very little new in the document. It didn't even seriously and concretely talk about replacing one-off housing across the country or replacing car use with public transport options. It talked only about public transport options to 2021 because we haven't figured out what we're doing after that. This plan is supposed to, in the words of the Taoiseach at the beginning, deal with life out to 2050. What we found instead was an awful lot of sort of talk about electrifying cars, reducing speed limits on the things, and almost nothing about how people are going to get around between their jobs, between their houses and everything else, and what that might actually mean for reducing carbon credits in a real way. This is an unacceptable level of public planning for this country. It makes references to a national planning framework. Well, we should have missed the deadline, produced the national planning framework first, and then decided what we were going to do with carbon sort of credits, if we were going to do it, rather than now have a plan that is actually going to be significantly impacted by some decisions yet to come. People who buy houses buy them for the future. It's not fair on them to not explain to them where that future is. And we as citizens living on this island should be demanding an awful lot more of our governments. They have tough decisions, but we haven't done a good job in making those decisions in the first 100 years of independence. We got a hint of some of those decisions yesterday in that carbon plan. We saw a little bit about the carbon footprint destruction that we have by having the highest percentage of people living in rural areas in the European Union. But we didn't mention anything about the public health damage that caused from the kind of congestion, commuting, lack of exercise and the loneliness caused by those choices that we had in the past. The future of Ireland could and should be very bright. But we must face up to those keys. And one of the measures we must use is the livability of our island, the livability of our lives on that island, whether it's in rural areas or in urban areas. And I would say, perhaps slightly different to some of the speakers here, I think our ambition has got to be a hot, lot higher. On this most recent trip across Europe, I've seen some of the best public infrastructure. I've traveled on great public transport, and I've actually hung out on great public realm. I come back to Ireland, I look for the same. I'm afraid I don't see it. We are once again reaping the bad harvest of terrible planning decisions that we've gone through in the last couple of years. But we need to change, and the question is how can we do so? It's 100 years now since freedom in this island, and we all kind of grumble a little bit about these things. But basically, more often than not as a people, we just accept that it's good enough. Sure, it's grand. Is this what our island is worth? Is this actually what we're worth as a nation? We've allowed ourselves to be bought off over and over again at electoral polling booths by short-term gains serving our own special interests. It's not good enough to simply blame our politicians. We have to ask what is wrong with our electorate that they haven't demanded a larger plan and measured the politicians against the deliver of that. Think about it. What was the last big transformative public realm space project that we as a nation have done that sits up there with the likes of Cove Harbour as an infrastructure or Stevens Green or the People's Park? Is the Dunleary Library or the much vaulted 
Dublin Convention Centre the best we can do in terms of new public buildings for our nation? How much of the infrastructure of our finest public buildings was conceived or built before 1916, not since? The Port Tunnel, the Tume Limerick Motorway, or the Dublin Cross City Lewis, some of the things we just talked about, are hardly up there with the world's great infrastructure projects. When little, little old Luxembourg City, where I was this, this week, is connected to Paris with a double-decker TGV that gets there in two hours and five minutes, a journey that takes four hours and ten minutes by car. Imagine our country in terms of the choices that we would have on housing. I, mean, I probably differ a little bit with Connor. If actually we had that kind of a train system making it possible to be from Galway to Dublin in less than an hour or Limerick in Dublin in less than an hour rather than relying upon cars to get around. Last night, as I flew in over the Donegal sunlight, you could see what a beautiful county Dublin is, or Donegal is. But as you got closer to the ground, you could see how it had been destroyed, if I can say so, by one-off housing. One person on Twitter last night referred to this as some form of architectural acne. And in a way, he's right, <laughs> right? Little wonder that that sort of unsustainable development has led to a decline of rural area as, and the services all over our country. When will we be honest enough to call out that that is unsustainable dwelling um, planning and we cannot afford it? And before I get shot down, because I'm probably the, only, the main person defending the west of Ireland on Dublin on this podium, even though I've been accused of wanting to shut it down, um, I have not said we should shut down rural Ireland, I just have said that we need to find a way to develop it in a way that's much more sustainable. When you travel on a train across rural France or rural Luxembourg or Denmark, you realise it does not have to be like the rural Ireland that we're building with their one-off housing. We all think we love to live in close-knit communities. We know they're both safer, they're more fun and they're probably more likely to be economically sustainable. What is it in our Irish psyche then that makes us want to have and live in a detached house of a three-quarter acre or an acre with cut grass rather than the unspoiled countryside that we live in here in Donegal and probably foreign plants growing in our walled-off garden. When we get to live in cities, we do the same. Rather than living in good public realm, we all want to have an apartment with a kid's playground so our kid or kids can play in splendid isolation rather than out in the public realm with other kids. There is a better way, but selfishness has to be subordinated to the common good and good planning has to be adopted. Because we know, if we put our mind to it, there is nothing we, the Irish, cannot achieve. Nothing. We are a great nation, as has been said, and a great people. We have built great cities, tunnels and infrastructure in other parts of the world. We've built the largest airline in Europe. We built America, goddammit. And that's supposed to be one of the best nations on the earth. Why then, when we come back to Ireland, do we settle for something and say, it's okay, sure, it's grand. We are the best nation in the world, and we should therefore have the best cities and the best rural areas and the best rural countryside to match. We're a bunch of legends who are fighting for somebody else's cause, but not our own. Just one illustration, this week at the EIB, we approved a loan for an Irish company sponsored by our own DFA, Department of Foreign Affairs, to give basically play, um, how I, payment services to people in Ethiopia for foreign aid. But yet here in Ireland, we don't have our health system on an electronic card like the Danes have had for years. We also approved the financing of the 15th line of the Paris Metro, a 10 kilometre tramway project in the city of Liège, which has a population of only 200,000. Not so long ago, we approved for our house, Denmark's second city, which has 250,000 people. We financed 110 kilometres, 51 station light rail station for a city smaller than Cork. How far away is Cork from something equivalent? In Dublin, which is supposed to work well, if I hear some of what I said, it takes 45 minutes to travel 13 kilometres from the airport to the main train station servicing our three, at least official, next largest cities. That's twice as long as it takes to travel it by car. What is that saying? That when you have people who can afford a taxi or afford a car, they get treated better than the people who cannot afford a car or cannot afford to actually pay for that privilege. When I got back to the airport this week, there were signs all over the place saying, we're catering for the future, they said. 
What are they doing? Building more car parking spots beside Terminal 2, right beside the space where if you're getting a bus, you have to come out and stand in the rain while you wait to pay to get onto a bus. How are we treating our visitors? How are we treating the people who cannot afford a car or expensive airport parking? But when it comes to it, we don't care. We say we're grand. Our lives are cities. We think it's actually fine. We assume this strange apathy. It makes no sense. Now, Robert Watt spoke this week about there being no tooth fairy uh, to fund infrastructure, and he's absolutely right, and I actually welcome him as usual. It's refreshing to hear him call it out. But there is money. It's a matter of choices. We're no longer a poor country. European structural funds no longer will pay for our infrastructure. We have to manage to pay them ourselves. We're incredibly lucky. We pretty much don't pay for defence and national security to the same level as any of our other European countries. We can blame the bankers, but that was only 30 billion of our national debt of 200 billion, which we have taken out to pay for other choices. In reality, we have harder choices to make going forward. Firstly, we have to live in less selfish ways to make the delivery of public services more affordable. Secondly, we probably have to pay more into the system or take less out of the system for the greater good to be better planned and delivered. And as Robert knows only too well, that includes a lot of decisions, including across a whole range of pension areas and others. We have to make decisions. Do we want infrastructure or do we want higher salaries and higher pensions? Reducing the public transport costs in our cities disproportionately helps the less wealthy in our society. Why not tax car usage? Why not tax employer-provided parking on a heavy basis, especially if it's beside public transport nodes that should be used? It should be a target of government to make travel faster by public transport, not slower than by cars. It should be a binding KPI for Robert and his colleagues and for Leo and his colleagues that we have a much higher percentage of housing that you can live in, walk, use public transport, and not actually be obliged to have a car, or indeed even two cars. <coughs> Let's be honest, up to now we have made selfish lifestyle decisions, and we have allowed that to happen in our country. Indeed, we've actually probably encouraged it, which is not a way to deal with an equal society, and it is most certainly not a way to ensure social stability. We put up at commute times to reach jobs, typically in Dublin, and we kind of console ourselves saying it was worse when we worked in London or in New York. Well, Dublin is no New York and it's no London, and as we're learning harshly after the Brexit decisions of many financial institutions, it doesn't even compare with Frankfurt. We should demand more of our leaders than fixing our local pothole or reopening our local Garda station. So what is it about us here in Ireland Look at, by contrast, Irish people leading the world across the other countries. We are a nation of builders and dreamers. We visit Copenhagen, we see that it's much better. We use the UK and the US particularly, where infrastructure investment has been at scandalously low levels. We see other things better, but we don't look for that when we come back to our country. What I say to you now today is it's time to start dreaming in Ireland. It's time to start dreaming of golden streets with attractive, affordable housing that our experts have kept saying for years we cannot build here in this island for some reason, but it can be done elsewhere. We should dream of kids playing safely again in our streets. We should dream of fast trains connecting our cities that seems impossible. We should dream of hosting one of Europe's best health systems, not one of its worst, with medical records up in the cloud like our Facebook holiday snaps. We should dream of creating water from the air and energy from the sun hitting our roofs because that is possible. We should dream of other places on our island finally eclipsing Dublin as the only place to live. Then when we have dreamed we must demand those dreams of our leaders. But we have to plan to do that. We have to plan not to just build more housing, especially one-off housing, wherever you want to live my friend. We have to plan for how we continue to welcome newcomers to our island. We must plan in a way that our country finally becomes not just the best place to do business, but the best place to live. We should demand everything we can dream of for once. And finally, let us become Europe's coolest new place to live, 
with some of the coolest metropoles, however we'll define the size of those under Connor's definitions. And we'll ensure that Ireland is measured not just on a competitiveness wage sort of you know, economic gain, but rather on the basis of stability, fairness, and most importantly of all, that nebulous concept of happiness. Now the good news is that the message is hitting home, I think, in Dublin. They've worked out that we need to deal with considerable infrastructure structure developments. There are global changes that we need to take into account to do that. And I would say that they are right when they do the national planning framework. We do need to step away from business as usual. But what does that mean in practice? Well, there are many different ways of actually looking at this. I've already explained in the articles that were mentioned earlier, so I won't go into much detail, about the need for a new spatial strategy, an opportunity to rebalance the country, the lopsided growth of the country, simply because all the services are often put into Dublin. And I agree with what was said, that services in Dublin service an awful lot of the rest of the country. But I'd like people in Dublin to also understand that sometimes services put outside of Dublin can indeed service Dublin as well if the same proper connectivity is actually established between those locations and that large city. We should speed up our public transport and we should finally reduce our car dependent suburbs. And in that way we can finally look forward to actually having a cluster of cities interconnected that can compete on an international stage. And the last point I want to make is that in order to do that though, we need a complete change of mindset in the way we have approached decisions in Ireland. We need to stop rewarding those who want to live selfishly. We need to reward instead those, for example, willing to chuck the idea of having two private cars and a garden outside their front door. Those willing to share their lives with others in dense urban areas should not be forced to put their lives on hold while those people come careering in in their cars creating congestion. We must create affordable housing centrally in our new cities and we must stop having restrictions and regulations that protect vested interests. And if you want to understand what I mean by that, because that is the most important point of all, Often we hear decisions about these between haves and have-nots as some assumption that it's between people who have money and people who do not. In a country like ours with a massively growing population, we have a new Irish division. It is between those vested in the status quo and those who will never perhaps vest in that status quo. And if you want to know what I mean, think about somebody who water was given a three-bedroom house and a garden and a parking spot close to Dublin City Central some 30 years ago, and compare their lot to their three kids now looking for housing, or a new immigrant who has arrived to Ireland hoping to have a new future. We can no longer pander to the needs of people who decide just because they always had a car, they should continue to have a car. We should not allow people who built houses in the field beside their parents to necessarily think that they can give that right to their kids, depriving our nation of agricultural land which is valuable, and indeed giving something that is not available to anybody else. And when we think about the infrastructural spend that we're going to make, when we think about the improvements in the value of the housing in our cities particularly that that will bring, let us ask is it fair that those people will have value created in their households that will probably never be subjected to tax? under our current rules. We can, we must do better. The new millennial generation has travelled thanks to Ryanair and has seen a different world. It is now time for them to step up and demand of our, our leaders that enough is enough. It is an important point to remember that we do not give this island to our, our grandchildren as some form of inheritance. Rather, I prefer thinking that it is those who have loaned it to us for a short period of time that we are the leaders and the generation making the decisions. We cannot continue to screw it up for them. We cannot continue to do what we are doing to their environment and what we are doing to create unacceptable new divisions and equalities on this island. We can do much better. Because you know what? If the Irish can't figure out how to do it, then maybe it can't be done. Thank you very much.